Welcome to the pre-recorded session for Support Beyond the Studio, Critical Pedagogy and Art Librarianship. My name is Courtney Hunt, and I am the Art and Design Librarian at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. I would also like to acknowledge the Shawnee, Miami, Lenape, and Wyandotte peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Central Ohio. And my name is Michelle Jennings. I am the art librarian at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And I acknowledge that I am presenting on the traditional ancestral lands of the Osage Nation and the Adena and Hopewell traditions. And at the time that my institution was chartered by an act of Congress in 1797, the Western Confederacy were the stewards of this land. Our session description talks about how art librarianship is uniquely positioned to use elements of critical pedagogy. In order to fully serve artists, it is super necessary to approach artists as whole people. This is a tenet of critical librarianship and critical pedagogy in general, but so much creative work involves personal experience and political ideology that this comes up in our work naturally. So we thought, how can we take elements of art education and practice and expand to areas outside of the library? The solution was to discuss the pedagogical pedagogical usefulness as well as pitfalls of studio critique. In this presentation, we will go over why critique can be a useful instrument in information literacy instruction and what to look out for in terms of making sure things don't go sour. And at the end, we will give a short description of what we'll be doing in our synchronous session. So in order to help you understand uh, what we mean about some of the information seeking behaviors of artists, we've selected this quote from Sandra Cohen. Um, and really what this is getting at is um, sort of the tendency of information seeking behavior and library literature in general to simplify or corporatize information needs and to focus on uh, answers that questions that need to be answered rather than uh, sort of open-ended inquiry um, and moving away from the cold technicality, technicality of information seeking. Under, understanding the way that artists interact with library information, they browse, they find inspiration everywhere. While they don't always check out things, they benefit from interacting with books as objects, which isn't traditional research, but is research nonetheless. Um, many of these studies show some very ableist attitudes towards artists. They play off of the mad genius trope or the assumption that artists are personalities, not highly trained principled, principled practitioners. That because they do not have straightforward, easily answered information needs, that they are not using the library correctly, or just assume that there is a correct usage in the first place. Remember that research practices among artists vary greatly, but within this research paradigm, everything is information. And in the case of artists, even material is information. But just as anything can be artistic output, anything can be input. And artists are relatively agnostic to research methodology. They use what they need for whatever project they are pursuing. While it's not what we think of as a regular research agenda, it still implies a high level of diligence and engagement and situates the studio as a site of inquiry and information creation, which can inform how we teach as information literacy practitioners as well. So um, some of the models obviously for artists information acquisition can be flawed, especially when it comes to teaching. So uh, we decided to turn to studio pedagogy to help us understand more about pedagogical and cognitive models for artists. And it's important to remember here that the signature pedagogy for studio programs is the critique. Uh, and so within that model, we have students who are working solo on projects and then coming together in groups to critique each other's work and to provide feedback. So this is naturally very dialogic. And when it's done correctly, it's focused on tangible remedies and encouragement. Um, it also builds the communal bond among students. Uh, if you imagine sort of what the ideal studio looks like, everybody has individual workstations. So they're working for hours together in the same space, um, charting each other's progress, and often, oftentimes providing more informal critique and feedback and discussion about the work. And we can see particularly in design disciplines that this is preparing them for their professional practice and the practice of working in um, in a design uh, studio. Um, but it's also training them how to talk about their work, how to build their networks, 
and how to um, begin to um, understand the, the language of, of their work. Um, it's also centering issue and inquiry over methodology or cl clear answers, sort of like what we were talking about uh, with uh, the information seeking behaviors of artists. But finally, we can see that the object is the center of pedagogy and that um, knowledge in this case is acquired experientially. And we mean that both in terms of the personal experiences that often uh, students bring to their work, but also the experience of making, the practice of making as a form of acquiring information and acquiring knowledge. And so uh, everything that you just saw on the last slide uh, as part of studio pedagogy assumes the perfect learning conditions as well as a well facilitated and managed critique. And so anybody who has gone through a critique or a studio program knows that this can go upside down and that um, power relations are not ideal, um, particularly when um, critique of an object can fall down the slippery slope of critique of the creator and their experiences, or when um, the experience of receiving critique from a, a power, a source of power and authority like an instructor can begin to make students feel cowed in a certain respect. And so um, in the documentary, The Room of Silence by Eloise Sherrod, we see that works by queer and BIPOC students especially are subject to problematic critique. Um, the silence in the title can either refer to um, the silence that they experience from their white non-queer peers or instructors when they are sort of too worried about saying the wrong thing or not informed enough to make meaningful critique, or the silence that they as students experience when their peers and instructors make comments like, why don't you just get over it? Uh, you need to explore something else in your work when referring to their race or in relation to their otherness. And in particular, um, there is this pressure and critique to not be defensive and to mute the emotional response um, and to accept the critique. And this is obviously particularly harmful when that critique centers on the creator's identity and their expression of that identity. And as in other places, um, we can see that there's also the hidden curriculum. As I mentioned previously, uh, critique is a way for students to build the sort of professional norms, professional practices that they'll experience after graduation. But of course, we have to consider the other norms and the other types of um, ways in which straying outside of that norm is experienced in the studio. Uh, the art curriculum itself, even art history, design history, um, reinforces established hierarchy through um, sort of the emphasis on the quote unquote Western canon and the focus on uh, white artists sort of in uh, um, Western countries. So um, we can see that these sort of classroom inequities are, are reinforcing established hierarchies which sort of students of color or queer students are experiencing sort of in their day-to-day -day lives already. In light of the downsides just discussed of studio pedagogy, it is, in, it is helpful to keep some tenets of feminist pedagogy at the forefront of our minds. In this case, we've chosen to highlight critical consciousness, relationship building, and empowerment. When performed in the best of circumstances, studio critique naturally fosters these things for many of the reasons Michelle just covered. However, when and if there is a power imbalance in the process, it is necessary to revisit why we may want to use this as a framework. Empowerment is particularly important to emphasize so that voices aren't suppressed in the process of sharing and critiquing. In an information literacy session, um, this may be as simple as, you know, supporting someone as they come up with keywords for searching, um, rather than coming from a place of not understanding um, a word or a term or an idea, um, seeking to support that person and build relationships and have conversations about it so that the whole room can benefit from that process. So in order to begin to organize some of our thoughts around these three um, areas of exploration, the information seeking behavior of artists, uh, studio pedagogy and feminist pedagogy, and to find the connections and maybe the action items therein, we decided to create sort of a concept map. And this is a very simplified version of the concept map, of course. It was much messier when we were 
making it. But what we found is that um, there are some connections in terms of the information seeking behavior of artists and studio pedagogy. There is this sort of um, emphasis on open-ended inquiry and the primacy of the object uh, in learning. And that there is sort of this very personalized relationship with information. And at the same time that there is a, a, an emphasis on communal information acquisition. So that also kind of connects to feminist pedagogy in the, in, in the idea of, of working as a collective, developing dialogic strategies and ways of exchange and building community and uh, identity. And finally, um, with feminist pedagogy and the information seeking behaviors of artists, we found that th there was this importance in honoring um, personal experiences and the artist's background, um, but also establishing horizontal relationships and partnerships um, within these communities and within the library as well. Uh, there's sort of a champion championing of ambiguity uh, in information and in uh, sort of the way the ways in which cognition works, as well as a recognition of the importance of the visual and visual representation in, um, in building information, in creating information. For art librarians, some resulting interventions include studio visits that build relationships and repertoire, as well as student-led exhibitions. Letting the students lead is key to having an experience that reflects them as people and the knowledge they bring to the library. This is true in InfoLit sessions as well. For broader applications, consultation should be looked at as a relationship building experience and opportunity to get to know students holistically and reflective making and writing in InfoLit sessions, as well as peer-to-peer -peer instruction, allowing students to thoroughly think through the choices they're making in regards to their research. So we hope that this uh, demonstration of how concept mapping and sort of developing interventions based on that is helpful. And what we're hoping when we all meet together synchronously is that you'll take some of that and apply it to our breakout groups, which will be great fun. Uh, we'll be having you do a very similar mind mapping exercise, and then we'll be engaging in a constructive, well-facilitated and, um, empowering group critique. Um, we really look forward to seeing you there and we thank you for your attention during this presentation. Thank you, we'll see you soon. <laughs>